So in this video, we will be talking a little bit more about gravity. So um, we've already worked with Newton and we have talked about his three laws, but there was another law that Newton is pretty famous for, and it's his universal law of gravitation. And this simply states um, that gravity attracts any two objects depending on their masses and the distance between them. <laughs> so I'm just going to go ahead and give you the full equation. Um, let the shock of it just take a deep breath after you see it and then we'll talk through it. So it's capital G times m1 times m2 divided by r squared. Okay. So that's a lot in a very small space. Okay. So the first thing that we need to know um, is g. So this is a capital G. Um, this is a constant, just like our lowercase g, 9.81. Um, but this g is a much uh, longer number. But in fact, it's actually much smaller. It's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. Okay, so 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th, so a very small number. And then we've got these weird wacky units over here. Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. You will always be provided those numbers. Um, this number. You are not expected to memorize it. You don't even have to memorize the units. It's a given constant, just like um, how little g is 9.81 always, big G is always 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Okay. And then we also have m1 and m2. These are going to be the two masses that we'll be observing in every single problem. So what two masses are we looking for? Now r we already talked about with our circular motion um, that r um, is a radius. In this case, it's a very specific radius. It's the difference between the centers of the masses. So what does that mean? If we were to take two objects and that they were, we we're trying to find the attraction between them, we would look at the distance from their center of masses. So for, s for spheres and circles, our center of masses are always in the direct center due to geometry. And so we will look at the distance between those centers of masses. And that's how we calculate it. Kay. There's not much else to explain in terms of the universal law of gravitation. Um, but there are some really good questions that we can be asked. So I'm going to jump right into a few examples. Um, so like I said, it can be, uh, grav the universal law of gravitation allows us to find the force of gravity between any two objects. So we've, up to this point, we've thought about the Earth acting on us, but in reality, we're acting on everything else that has mass around us. So if you're sitting on a chair, you're actually attracted to the chair because there's a force of gravity between those two objects. In this question, we're going to look at two students. In this case, they are two 75 kilogram students, and their center of masses are 0.95 meters apart. So in this case, mass one is equal to mass two, and they're both 75 kilograms. That's really nice where we don't have to have two masses. Um, I'll show you how we work that in. And then we're looking at the distance between the two students that's 0.95 meters. We're going to look for force of gravity. Now notice that this is still f of g. This is the force of gravity. That has not changed, but instead of looking at little g, we're going to use big G. And then we want to do Newton's. Okay. So when we go to plug uh, to look at this problem, we want to start with our original formula. m1, m2 over r squared. Since it's already rearranged for what we want, 
we can just plug in our numbers and go. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th multiply by our two masses. So 1 is 75, 2 is also 75. So we have to include both of those. And then we're going to divide it by 0 0.95 and then square that radius. The hardest part about these problems is plugging it into a calculator. Um, I typically recommend putting the entirety of the, t the numerator in parentheses, um, using your exponent buttons on your calculator if you have them available, and then dividing by the denominator in parentheses as well. And don't forget to square that denominator. Okay, so I want to show you what I got on the calculator. Um, after plugging it all in, I had all of these zeros. Now, I could write out all of those zeros and be perfectly correct, um, but there's a shorthand way to do it. So we're just going to use scientific notation. If you need practice on scientific notation, I put a little guide on um, the class website. Okay. So this number essentially boils down to 4.16 times 10 to the negative 7th. Oh, we know that our unit is newtons. Okay. So I just want us to take um, a quick pause and look at this number. This is a very, very small number. We saw that in the calculator. That's a very small number. Okay. Um, that's because these two objects, these two students, aren't very massive. So there is a gravitational force attr of attraction, but are they really going to be able to feel it? No, they're not going to be able to. Alternatively, if we look at the mass times g, uh, g of the acceleration due to Earth, that's going to give us the attraction of the person to the Earth. Now, 735 newtons, that's something that we all feel, especially when we trip and fall. Okay? So it's the point that I want to make is that there is always a gravitational attraction between two masses. However, that, ma that attraction can be very, very small. The next problem that I'd like to address is what I'd like to call a common question alert. Oh, you can't really see it here. This is common question alert with three exclamation points. Okay. Um, this is a very common problem. We haven't worked too much with these types of problems yet but they are very, very popular as we continue throughout our physics course. Okay. So here we have a satellite weighing 9,000 newtons on Earth's surface. Um, how much does it weigh if its mass is tripled and its orbital radius is doubled? So there aren't really numbers there. Okay, so how on Earth can we go about this problem. Okay. So, well, let's look at what's going to happen. So, if we were to draw this problem out, we're going to have the Earth in the middle and our satellite is traveling around it. So this is going to be our initial radius. That's going to be R1. The second part of the problem says that our radius is doubled, so a doubled radius would be maybe a little bit more than that. It's probably not to scale, but that's going to be the distance of 2r. Okay. Then our mass here is just going to be a typical mass, and then we're going to look at triple the mass over here. So that's what's going on. We've gone from a single radius and a single mass to twice the radius and three times the mass. Once again, no numbers. So let's look at the force of gravity. So we do want to use um, this uh, universal law of gravitation, so mass 1, mass 2, over the radius. Now they tell us that on Earth, this weighs 9,000 newtons. So on Earth, which we can use f of g, this is just equal to 9,000 newtons. Okay. But after
after we get away from the Earth and we have a much larger radius, we need to step back to this universal law of gravitation. So let's see what happens to our formula when we add in these doubling and tripling factors. So I'm going to say mass 1 is the Earth, and that's not going to change. But mass 2 was tripled, so we're going to have 3 times mass 2. And then, whoops, sorry, I forgot to square that. And then what's going to happen to our radius? Well, our radius was doubled. So when we double it, we need to include that inside the square. Okay. So we still have g times m1, which is the Earth. We triple our satellite, and we double our radius, but we square this. Now, what I see when I look at this problem well, I see that the G's match, the M's match in both cases, and the R's match in both cases. And I just have these weird factor numbers. Well, I can factor those out of my problem. I can take the three out of the top and rearrange this. And I can take this two squared value out. So if I take two squared out, it becomes four times my radius squared. Now, what I've essentially done is just rearrange the formula. So now I've got 3 over 4 multiplied by this. Well, what is this equal to? This whole thing here is equal to that 9,000. Because look, it's the same thing that's here. So when I go to look at my force of gravity, I see that I can do 3 fourths. That's not factored into this part here but it's 3 fourths times 9,000. Okay. From there, I can plug it into the calculator. 9,000 times 3 fourths. And I get that my satellite will now weigh 6,750 newtons. Okay. So this is... Um, these problems can be very difficult um, if you're not used to rearranging things like this. Um, but when I said this is, uh, we need to keep our variables in as long as possible, um, I was trying to prepare you a little bit for these problems where you won't always have numbers. We will have a few of these to practice. Um, I did want to make one other point. Um, so on the Earth, this satellite weighed 9,000 newtons. When we were outside of the Earth, and even though we tripled our mass, our force of gravity was much smaller. That's because we were also four times away um, from the surface of the Earth. Okay. So, uh, as you can see, this is a smaller number than what we weigh on Earth, which is what we would expect as we get further away from the Earth. And on that same note, I wanted to uh, clarify some very common misconceptions. So nothing too big to write here, um, but I just wanted to uh, clarify a few things. Um, there's a distinct difference between mass and weight. Mass is the amount of matter, the amount of stuff that makes an object up. So it, you have a certain mass, and if I take you to the moon, you're going to have the same amount of mass. The amount of stuff, the number of atoms, molecules and compounds that make you up is not going to change. On the other hand, weight is entirely due to gravitational attraction. It depends entirely on uh, your location. So on Earth, you might weigh um, 120 pounds, but then if you go to the moon, you're going to weigh a lot less, okay? because that gravitational force is so uh, much has a lesser effect on you than it does on Earth. Well, we could go to Jupiter, and you're going to get crushed because the force due to uh, gravity on Jupiter is so much stronger than it is here on Earth. So these are two important things to keep in mind. The other thing I would like to add is weight is a force. Weight is a force, and mass is not a force. Okay, um, that's one thing I've seen us get a little mixed up on, 
So just to clarify, weight is a force while mass is not. So I have one last thing I'd like to cover in this video, um, and that's satellites in orbit. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, so I did not handwrite this out because the way they stated it was pretty perfect. So satellites in orbit, um, such as the moon around the Earth, are constantly falling. Um, but it's not as scary as you might think. It doesn't fall towards the Earth, but it falls around the Earth. So what do I mean by that? So if we're going to take the Earth and we're going to have the moon around it, essentially it's falling. It's going to fall this way and then this way and then fall a more and fall some more and fall and fall and fall and continue to fall until it reaches its original place. Okay? So the moon is going to constantly fall. The only thing that prevents it from going uh, away from the Earth is the gravitational force of the Earth on the moon that's holding it there. Okay? Um, just as you were in a, uh, as if you were in an elevator that was falling towards Earth, you'd feel weightless. If you were on um, a satellite falling around the Earth, you will also feel weightless. That's why in the International Space Station we see all these great videos of um, you know, them doing really cool things like how does water, you know, being poured out of a, a, a water bottle act in space? Because it feels weightless, okay? There's still mass, but there's no weight. Okay. Um, I have one last thing that we can calculate from uh, this information. I'm going to try to make it uh, quick because I know this video is getting pretty long. So here we have a 4,500 kilogram Earth satellite has an orbital radius of 8.5 times 10 to the 7th meters. At what speed does it travel? Well, um, if you've already watched uh, the vertical circular motion videos, we had a case very similar to this. I'm going to draw a quick free body diagram just to show you what I mean. Um, here's the Earth, and we have some object orbiting the Earth. What is the only force causing that satellite to continue in its circular motion? Well, it's the force of gravity. There's nothing else acting on it. This is identical to when we were looking for the minimum speed in a vertical circular pr problem. We know that we're moving in a circle, so we want our centripetal force, and the only force acting on us is the force of gravity. Okay. So here's the information that we have. We know that our satellite is um, we know that our satellite is 4,500 kilograms. That's going to be our mass two. Typically, if we have the Earth, um, we always designate it as math as mass one. In all honesty, that's out of really what scientists call out of respect for our planet. Um, they can be pretty formal about this. Um, and then our radius is 8.5 times 10 to the seventh meters. Okay. So let's plug in, uh, substitute in what we know. We know our centripetal force is going to be our mass um, times V squared over R. So that's how we're going to get that velocity value that we want. Now in terms of the mass, this is actually the, m the mass of the satellite because that's what's moving around. So that's going to be mass 2. And then for Fg, we're going to use the universal law of gravitation. We have mass 1, that's the Earth, and mass 2 as the satellite. Then we have our radius squared. So before we continue, we have two things that can cancel out. Okay? Um, the easiest one to see is this mass 2. So mass 2 cancels out on both sides. So even though they gave us mass 2, we don't need it. The other thing that cancels out, which might not be as obvious, is this r value. So there's, we divide by 1r over here, and we divide by 2r's over here. So this radius cancels, as does the square on that side. It's the same thing as if I multiplied both sides by r. Okay. So I'm left with v squared equals g times m1, which is the Earth, 
over the radius. Okay. So um, I can just take the square root of this and I think we'll be ready to plug numbers in. Now, um, some of you may be thinking, well, what on earth is the mass of the earth? Do I have to memorize that? And the answer is no. Um, you will never be asked to memorize the mass of the earth. Um, you will typically be given this. So the, the mass of our planet earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And I guess to extend the square root, that's so how very long numbers. So I just plugged in g. We know that 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, that's given. This would be given to you. So the only thing that w is not a known value is the radius. So we're going to have 8.5 times 10 to the seventh meters. Ooh, that's a lot of numbers. Be very careful in your calculator. Use an exponent button if you have that information, if you have that available. Keep the numerator um, in uh, parentheses if you are able. And I would also, um, if you're not using an exponent button, put the denominator in parentheses as well. Okay, so after plugging that all in, I got 2,166.23 meters per second, and that is my velocity.